Morning, family. Then jam. Set a timer down so I don't go too long. Um, hey, real quick, one announcement. Um, Saturday, January 18th. Uh, if you haven't seen it on the Facebook page, or we'll, we'll make sure it starts getting announced. But uh, we're going to have a memorial service, a celebration of life for our sister Marcina Sandberg. And that'll be at uh, the Old Trinity, his church Anglican, on um, Six Mile. So please put that in your calendar. It'll be at 1 o'clock, uh, 1 p.m. is when we're going to start singing. And it'll be fun. We've, we've asked people don't show up in a sour, down mood wearing all black. Because that's not who Marcina was. So feel free to you can feel free to wear some bright colors if you remember Marcina's life. So uh, just wanted to make that announcement before we get started. So this morning we're gonna start uh, a series called Legacy. Choose Legacy. And the the idea is that you can uh, leave something behind that will carry on after you are not here. And it's funny that I'm doing this, we're starting this series, on my last day as a minister of Detroit Church of Christ. It's actually our last Sunday as members of the Detroit Church of Christ uh, because of us moving to Grand Rapids. But this idea of legacy, this idea that my life could mean something beyond me. And I think a lot of that resonates with a lot of us. Um, we do want our life to have meaning. Yeah. We want, you know, even if it's just the memory of us. I, I know, like, um, a prayer that I never prayed uh, until Jen's dad passed away was that God would protect memories of him in our minds and in the minds of our, of our boy. That, that I want to remember people even when they're not in front of me anymore. And I think we would all hope that after we leave, whether that's moving away or passing on from this life, that we'll be remembered, right? Well, I'm going to talk about something that's very kind of dear to us, Jen and I. It's kind of our, one of our mottos, and that is a life of adventure. And that's, that's going to be the title of my lesson. All right. A life of adventure. I think, like I said, I think it resonates with a lot of people. I, I think most people, even if it were just purely idealistically, they, they wish that they could have an adventurous life. Now, most some people err on the side of safety, and they're like, I just want to pay my bills and watch my shows, and that's fine. And I get that, but I think there's something in us that we do want an adventure, right? At least, we, at least we entertain ourselves with shows about adventure, <laughs> even if we know that we could never do that. Sure. And, you know, there was a time in my life where I was a young teenage boy and I thought, honestly, if I can just skate through life doing the least amount of work possible, that's awesome. Yeah. But then it, it start, something started stirring in me where I was like, no, that is not awesome. That's a waste of a life. And I don't want to go through life as a waste. I want to do something. I want to do something you know, amazing or awesome or whatever. I didn't know what it was when I was 20. Come on, bro. God had a plan for me that was very adventurous. Uh, and that was to die to myself and become a disciple of Jesus and then all the craziness that goes from there. So that's what we're going to talk about. I have three little, like, lessons that I've learned over the years of being a disciple. And it really is... Um, the difference between where I was and where I am now is kind of because of, like I said before, all of your influence, and particularly fun funneled through these three ways of looking at the world. Amen? Okay. So the first one, my point number one, I guess, is uh, you gotta leave room for adventure. Yes. So you say you want adventure. Well, you gotta leave room for adventure <laughs> or it's not gonna happen for you. And you, uh, you might be wondering, well, what does that mean? If, if I've counseled you, you probably heard me share the scripture that I'm about to share. Uh, we talk about this a lot. In the Old Testament, God gave a bunch of rules and laws and said, do this, don't do this, do this. Out of nowhere, he gives us this, um, this verse, specifically towards farmers, which I, which I think is really interesting. In Leviticus 19, 
9 and 10. When you reap the harvest of your land, do not reap to the very edges of your field or gather the gleanings of your harvest. Do not go over your vineyard a second time or pick up the grapes that have fallen. Leave them for the poor and the foreigner. I am the Lord your God. So I think you remember uh, me saying, like, when I was a freelance photographer as a, as a business owner, like, there were no verses in the Bible that helped me learn how to be a photographer. So I decided to pretend I was a farmer <laughs> because there's lots of verses in the Bible that help farmers. And so this, I started studying this stuff out. And this one, man, the more I meditated on this verse, the more rich meaning it had for my life. And I've used this for like contribution messages before. So if you were a, a, a field owner and you had a field, God said, here's how I expect you to live. Here's a rule that I'm gonna give you. Don't harvest all the way to the edges of your field. Leave a little, leave a little buffer. And if you're walking and you're picking stuff up and you drop something, don't pick it up. Don't go back over and, and re-harvest it. Leave. And what God is saying is, I'm doing this on purpose. This is how my people are going to take care of their neighbors. Okay? Wow. I am commanding you to do this. Now, there's a famous guy in the Old Testament who does this. A very righteous man by the name of Boaz. And this is how he meets Ruth. Because Ruth knows, I can go to Boaz and I can glean his fields. Okay? And so... We lift him up for following this law, okay, this rule. Yeah. And it's very easy for us to think, well, I'm not a field owner. I have no fields. I'm reading through the Bible in a year or whatever. I come across this and I go, blah, 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 harvest your land. Well, that doesn't apply to me, so this doesn't mean anything for me. Come on. So I don't really need to pay attention to it. Here's my, um, here's my concession. Yeah, we don't, we're not all farmers. We don't have fields. You're not out there harvesting. But what do you have? I would put before you that we all have something like a budget. And we all have a schedule. Some of us are gleaning right up to the edges of both. And God, you say, I want an adventurous life. And God says, well, here's your opportunity for adventure. And you say, oh, but I can't. Come on, man. I can't because I'm too busy or I don't have enough, whatever. And we have nothing left over to help others. Yes. Wow. So yeah, this, this, I think of this in terms of our contribution, but I think of this in terms of the busyness of life. Yes. Do people know that they can come to me for, that I'm not empty, yeah. that there's something that they can glean? They can come to me for encouragement. They can come to me for help. They can come to me for aid. Or do they know he's got nothing to give anyone? Yeah. Wow. Don't even go and look. Wow. Now Ruth knew Boaz yeah. is a righteous man. He will follow this law. I can glean in his field. But I think in our life, the more we get, the more we spend. Right. Yeah. Just in terms of our money, okay? Sure. And Colin and Beth got asked to go plant a church in Des Moines. And they came and they asked, hey, do you guys want to go to Des Moines? In the same way that I'm asking people, hey, do you want to come to Grand Rapids? <laughs> and Jen and I had just started a business. And we said, I'm sorry, we can't. We have, we have no ability to go on that adventure. Now fast forward, and we're in a different place in life. And Mark and Ruth are like, hey, so I'm thinking that maybe you guys could go into the ministry. And luckily, we didn't have the craziness of life. We had a, a lot more buffer. Yeah. And I actually just stopped, I, you know, I just took like two months off work. Uh, which means two months of not making any money. But I was able to give that for the ministry. But if, if an adventure came knocking on your door, okay. could you say yes to it? Come on, bro. Or would you have to turn it down? Because you never <laughs> left room for adventure. 
Here's a question I have to ask myself a lot. Is my life too busy for adventure? I say I want an adventurous life, and yet I can't handle an adventurous life because I just got too much stuff to do. Come on, bro. You know, Jesus that brought his generation an adventure, the, the, the adventure of the kingdom of God, and then he even talks about people who are like, sorry, I can't, my fields. Right. He says, it's not going to wait for you. And so in your life, what are your fields? What is the thing that you're tasked with taking care of? And do you glean right up to the edges of that? Do you have enough left over so that people know he's got something for me if I go to him? If I go to him in my time of need, he's got something for me. Or do we th they think, leave him alone? Because he's got nothing in the tank. That's just my, my intro. If you want a life of adventure, you've got to leave room for adventure. Right. So you say, okay, I promise from now on I will leave room for adventure because I want a life of adventure. You've got to be careful when you say that. Because <laughs> adventure ain't cheap. <laughs> Point number two, the price of adventure. Okay. Oh, man. man. We all say we want adventure until we get the bill yes. for an adventure. And then we're like, whoa, that's a little steep, don't you think? Now, I have gone up and down in this so many times over my spiritual life. Amen. And there are times where I was like, I'm all in, and then God was like, well, here's what it's going to take. And I was like, whoa, never mind. <laughs> and I think if you think back over your life, maybe you've seen yourself do this. Where you commit to something and then you realize, oh, this isn't what I thought it was going to be. This isn't as easy or comfortable as I thought it was going to be. And there's very few places in the Bible where God's like, hey, we're going to change the world. All from the comfort of your couch, without breaking a sweat in your spare time, and it's going to be awesome. God loves disrupting comfort and making you feel like, oh man, I, the world is falling apart. And so the price of adventure, maybe you've seen one of my favorite uh, Instagram, Pinterest verses, uh, Jeremiah 29, 11. We're going to talk about it. Uh, for I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord. Plans to prosper and not to harm you. Plans to give you a hope and a future. You can even get that verse on your cell phone. This is literally, I just typed in Jeremiah 29 11 into a Google image search and it just exploded. <laughs> And everybody loves to hold on to Jeremiah 29, 11. And it's a good verse. And I don't want to be one of those guys that like destroys scriptures for you. But if you know what I'm going to say, you already know what I'm going to say. <laughs> Jeremiah 29, 11 is beautiful. We've used this to study the Bible with people. We've used this to encourage people. But we do need to understand that there's more to it than just happiness. And if you think that... The adventure is going to take you from comfy to more comfy? That's not. You would never pay the price for a mission for a movie where it took someone who was comfortable and made them more comfortable. Because you know adventure is like danger and risk and threat and excitement. And yet you want that for your life and yet you don't want that for yeah. your life. Come on, Come on. So Jeremiah 29, 11. Let's actually look at it. Jeremiah 29, 11. I, I, for I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord. Plans to prosper you and not to harm you. Plans to give you hope and a future. Okay. That's so encouraging, right? It's so, like, reassuring that God would say that to us. Um, I have, I made Jen this thing, I painted on this wood thing, and it says, Life of Adventure. But it says, Jeremiah 29, 10 through 14. <laughs> because when you read this whole verse, it actually, actually destroys the idea of comfort. So here's, here's what that is. We'll start in 10. When 70 years are completed for Babylon, I will come to you and fulfill my good promise 
to bring you back to this place. And it ends with, and you will bring and will bring you back from captivity. I will gather you from all the nations and places where I have banished you. Wow. So this verse is actually a warning from God that includes a promise. It's actually saying, hey guys, some bad things are on the horizon. And some times of great turmoil and distress are coming. And yet, it's not going to destroy you. Yeah. Because I have a plan for you. Come on, ben. But we want the prosperity without the captivity. We want the, we want the good feelings without any of the bad stuff. Just give me the, the warm, fuzzy feelings. God's like, well, I'll do that, but after all the crazy goes down. Like, well, can you do that without any of the crazy? Can I get good feelings? Hold the crazy. And he's like, that's not how I roll. <laughs> and so what God is telling the Israelites here is, I have a great plan. It's not to destroy you. You think it's to destroy you. It's not to destroy you. But you're going to go through it. Come on, man. And there have been times where we have, we felt like we... We're being dragged up, yeah. spiritually, emotionally, financially, and we feel like, oh man, we're, we're being punished, or this, is, this feels like destruction. God's like, remember you want an adventure? This is the price of adventure. But I need, I need to ask you a serious question. Do you want cheap adventure? Do you only want adventure that comes at no cost? Mm. I'll only accept the adventure of life if there's no price tag involved. Right. And if the price gets too steep, I'm backing out. Right. Now here's, here's how this looks practically in a, in a church body. We, we want people to love us and serve us and give to us and encourage us. Well, well, the price tag is you got to love and serve That's and encourage right. other people. Yeah. Yeah. That's right. It's awesome when everyone comes and helps you move. But that means sometimes you got to get up and put your clothes on and go help someone move. Here's how this really gets into the nitty gritty is difficult conversations and speaking the truth in love. Come on, man. Come on, man. There's a lot of people that have been like, oh yeah, I want to be in the ministry. Like, man, the ministry is great. Except mostly it's telling people things they don't want to hear. <laughs> and having to be like, hey, bro, that wasn't really a good idea. Exactly. That thing you did, don't do that again. Like, <laughs> but that's the price of the adventure. Sure. Is that you're face to face with another person. And yeah, it gets messy. It hurts. Hurt feelings is the price tag for an adventurous life in the kingdom of God. Yeah. And you could be like, well, it shouldn't be like that. Whoa, careful throwing that word around. Right. Would and should. Like, it or should and shouldn't. Man, when we think this is how it should look, this is how church should look, God will throw a monkey wrench in those gears yeah. quicker than you can blink. Yeah. Think, well, it shouldn't be like this. Whoa, be careful. Because this is the price of adventure, is that it's not going to happen the way you think it should. Yeah, yeah. Every, every classic adventure movie that you guys have watched and grew up on, there's always something that you're like, whoa, I didn't see that coming, that was awesome. Yeah. If every story was 100% predictable, you'd be like, why, why buy the ticket? I'm not going to see that movie. It makes a boring adventure if everything goes exactly how you expect it to go. Yeah. And in our life, it's never going to go exactly how you think it should. That's the price of adventure. So many times in, in my marriage, I was like, well, this is what a Christian marriage should look like. And then God's like, get ready. Because <laughs> I'm going to teach you some things. And then the people that come into my life and help me make, learn those lessons, like, that is such a blessing. And yet, do I push them away? Because you shouldn't talk to me that way? 
I, I am terrified to think of the boy that I would still be if I didn't have people in my life who told me the things I needed to hear. Amen. Do I only want adventure at no cost? My prayer is that we're all, when we say we want adventure, we understand, oh man, this is going to be crazy. You and me, God, let's do this. That's the price of adventure. Here's, here's my last point. you got to learn from adventure. And this is the one that is, is kind of the hardest. Because sometimes, you know, we see the price tag, it's high. Like, man, this is, this is going to feel really uncomfortable. Or, let's just be honest, this is going to feel really painful for a while. And we think about great men throughout the Bible that God brought on a journey. Men like Joseph, or men like Moses. God's like, man, this is going to get nuts. They're, it's going to be so nuts, they're going to write this stuff down. People are going to read about it for thousands of years. And we read about it and go, wow, I can't believe you know, the, the story of Joseph. Like, God had a great plan, boy in the field, to ruling the nation. How are you going to get there? Oh, how about sold, falsely imprisoned, death row, all of that sort of stuff. Yeah. We're like, if I would have known that, I would have said no to all of this. <laughs> God's like, that's why I never told you. <laughs> and yet, what I love about Joseph is at the end, he's like, now I see why it all happened. Yeah. To save you guys. You know, David went on a lot of adventures. He went on some crazy things, and he felt like he was being just brutally afflicted and punished. And one of my favorite portions of a psalm in Psalm 119 uh, is where he kind of talks about learning from that adventure. Psalm 119, 65 through 72. Do good to your servant according to your word, Lord. Teach me knowledge and good judgment, for I trust your commands. Before I was afflicted, I went astray, but now I obey your word. You are good, and what you do is good. Teach me your decrees. Though the arrogant have smeared me with lies, I keep your precepts with all my heart. Their hearts are callous and unfeeling, but I delight in your law. It was good for me to be afflicted. So that I might learn your decrees. Come on, David. The law from your mouth is more precious to me than thousands of pieces of silver and gold. Yeah. You know, that's really pretty to hear. Mm. But when you're in it, do we pray that? You know, God, it was really good for me to go bankrupt because now I rely on you more. <laughs> Very few of us pray those things. Very few of us even still pray to, to be taken through those things. Yeah. God, is there something you need to teach me? Send me on that journey. He's like, that goes through affliction. Let's do it. Very few of us are out there crying out to God for that. Most of the time we're like, save me from this. And he's like, yeah, but you're going to be a different person on yeah. the other side. Yeah. Can't you just like... Matrix, download it to my brain. Like, whatever you need to teach me, just implant in my brain and my heart to make me the, the, the person you want me to be. It's like, don't really work that way. Here's how I change people. Through experiences and through other people. You know, I've, I've said this a bunch of times. You may have heard this before, but Jen and I had many financial woes uh, earlier in our marriage. Specifically, I remember the condo, all right? The condo, uh, we bought a condo, and it was great until we wake up one morning and it's just like, what is that? Sounds like it's raining outside. No, it's raining inside. It's raining in our kitchen. The sprinkler pipe burst over our kitchen. It was just like thousands of gallons of water coming down in our, in our house. We're like, oh no! Do you know how to show off the water? I'm like, I don't know how to show off the water. Call the super, hey, it, there's water everywhere. And he's like, you gotta turn it off on that side of the house, outside. There's like a little shed, go turn it off. I go out and there's a giant padlock on the shed. Oh, wow. 
And I come back in, I'm like, it's locked! This is a giant padlock. And he goes, I got the key. And I live 45 minutes away. So we just sat there. We just sat there and watched our whole like, I mean, we tried with buckets, but really, like, what's that going to be? Um, just thousands of gallons of water coming into our house. And then uh, they were like, hey, you'll be up, you'll be put up in a hotel for the weekend. We'll be, we'll be back here by Monday. It'll be great. We lived in that hotel for two months. <laughs> they could not get this place dry. <laughs> like, it's water. It's, how hard is water? We could not get this place dry to save our lives. And, and then we went through a lot of other things, too. With business and with different financial things. And at one point, we tried to calculate, like, how much money have we lost? Just lost like just gone. And it was a lot. <laughs> Considerable amount. And yet, and I've tried to, I've tried to tell this to, to several other people, including husbands, the transformation that I saw in my wife's character during that time, where admittedly she will tell you that she kind of like would get a, a bit of security from money. And then God said, oh, we're going to take all that away. And it was devastating at the time. It was horrible to go through, and I wouldn't wish it on my worst enemy. But if you came to me and said, I'll give you all that money back, but you're going to have to have that version of Jen before she blossomed into this amazingly strong, superior, wise, amazing woman she is now, I'd be like, keep your money. Because her growth and her like deepening in her understanding of God's nature and how God is our provider, and that God is our security, is worth more than thousands of pieces of silver and gold. Come on, John. And I would never want to go back. Like, oh, don't you wish you could go back and make all those wrong decisions right? Actually, no, because God in his infinite wisdom he brought me through that stuff, and he taught me lessons. And the man I am now, I would never want to revert right. back to that boy. Yeah, right. Amen. Yeah. But what is the lesson that God is trying to teach you right now? Yeah. It does not feel good. I get it. It does not feel good. But this is the life of adventure. Yeah. That when you want a life of adventure? Okay. I'm not doing this for fun. This isn't a roller coaster ride. There's no point to a roller coaster ride. You don't come out of a roller coaster ride more mature. You got your quick like woo thrills and you're the same person. And yet God's like, no, we're not about that. I do this for a reason because there is someone that I'm getting you to become. But you gotta like partner with me and, and accept those lessons that I'm teaching you. You know when, um, when Brian Perkins, I'm gonna go back to this. <laughs> Brian Perkins was here, he preached a couple weeks ago. And I, he said something to me when he was leaving Detroit. And a lot of us were there, we know that that was not, you know, it was a stressful time um, in a lot of our lives. And he, he was leaving and I was like, bro, how are you doing? And he said something that I will never forget. I don't know how many years ago that was, but it was 10 years, I think. He said something I'll never forget. He said, here's what I know. I know that God is good. And what he does is good. So this doesn't feel good. I don't like what's happening. But I know that there's no, there's no alternate plan that's more good or more loving because God is good and loving. And... That has helped me to process a lot of my adventures of life. Yep. If I stick close to God, I won't be, I won't be guaranteed comfort, but I will, I will be guaranteed goodness. Yep. Yeah. Even if that comes with a high degree of peril and danger right. and terror, because he is good and what he does is good. Yeah. Are you growing? By growing, learning, and maturing. If you've been a disciple for 15 years and you're still the same, my fear is that 
You're partaking in the roller coaster, but you're not partaking in the adventure. Come on. The price tag came, and you were like, nah, I don't want to do that. God's like, ah, oh, you're missing out. You're missing out on who you can be. So I have to ask myself all the time, am I growing? Am I learning? Am I maturing? Mm. Brothers and sisters, I love you guys so much. And this church has raised me spiritually. My prayer is that when we leave, that you guys go on amazing adventures for the rest of your lives. Some of you will leave. And you'll take your adventures with you. My prayer is that, one, you leave room for that adventure. That you're not stretched so thin that you're too busy for adventure. That when God comes and says, hey, I'm going to answer your prayer right now. Life's about to get really interesting. You say, let's do it. My other prayer is that when you, when you pray that thing and God gives you what you want, you know the price is high. And you're willing to step up. That you don't jump in and then go, whoa, that's just too much. You hang in there and you commit no matter what the cost of that adventure is going to be. So for some of you, it's going to be everything. For some of you, that adventure is literally going to be surrendering your whole life and making Jesus Lord of your life. Mm. And finally, my prayer is that you go on to grow and mature and to become just totally different people. Yeah. You look at Peter in the Gospels and First Peter his letter, he's a different man. Yeah. Yeah. Some of you now look kind of like Peter in the Gospels. <laughs> and I can't wait to see you when you're Peter, the elder apostle. Come on. Come on. Amen. Those are my prayers. I love you so much. Thank you. Amen.